Hey, Joel. What's up, Tim? So the villain in Mission Impossible 4. Yeah. He's a nuclear extremist. Uh-huh. What is that, like an X Games competition uh, where you hang glide or parasail with uh, uranium and plutonium under each arm? Uh, Tim, I think you might be a little super critical. Welcome to the Super Critical Podcast, where we delve into the fun and sometimes nonsensical way pop culture and nuclear issues interact. We watch a movie or TV show and then needlessly overanalyze it. My name is Tim Westmeyer. I am a nuclear enthusiast who has studied the history and policy of nuclear weapons and nuclear energy issues for over about 10 years. And I'm also told by friends, family, and other loved ones that I am an annoying person to watch uh, movies that have nuclear issues as a plot device. I usually nitpick it, and they don't like it so much. But that's why I have my uh, good co-host here to balance me out and, uh, and keep me straight. This is Joel. I am a movie enthusiast who knows nothing about nuclear weapons or nuclear energy, but I like a good movie, and I like a good chat afterwards. Well, that's good, because tonight we watched one of our favorite movies, Mission Impossible 4, Ghost Protocol. No plan, no backup, no choice. This is a 2011 action spy movie, one of the uh, Mission Impossible series with Tom Cruise as the lead. Uh, It's Ethan Hunt. We saw this one in the theater, if I recall. Oh, yeah. And it it was pretty fun. Um, It also stars uh, Jeremy Renner, Simon Pegg, uh, Paula Patton. J.J. Abrams uh, produced this one, so you kind of see his flair on it. He directed the third one, which we also love, but it doesn't involve any sort of nuclear things, unfortunately. Um, But it was directed by Brad Bird, who did a number of really classic movies that we like, uh, Iron Giant, Incredibles, Ratatouille. So kind of a fun jump for him to jump into the Mission Impossible uh, stream. Action genre. The action genre. Uh, but it did, w- it did pretty well. Uh, on a budget of about $145 million, um, it made 209 in the domestic box office, but did really well overseas. It won a Kids' Choice Award nominee for everyone's favorite butt kicker with Tom Cruise. Tom so Cruise. Not bad. Not a bad accolade. Clear. And, uh, and it, yeah, even Rotten Tomatoes thought it was pretty good, 93%. And Roger Ebert gave it 3.5 out of 4 stars. So another, another pretty good movie for us to cover. But it's, it's got some nonsense in here uh, when it comes to, to some of the nuclear issues. So we're looking forward to kind of talking about that. Um, but let's, play, let's talk about the context of this movie. So 2011, Joel. 2011, well, just in terms of international issues uh, and, and, and nuclear weapons, was 10 years after 9-11. Um, was an interesting phase where kind of the immediacy of, of the terrorist attack is a little behind us, um, but obviously uh, dealing with issues like uh, non-state actors and, and other people with uh, weapons of mass destruction still on the minds of policymakers and uh, uh, defense folks alike. That's true. And it's also a couple years after Russia invaded Georgia. Uh, it was in 2008, so it makes sense for, for Russia. Even though Russia is not the villain in this one, it's a, a, a Swedish... Um, special forces turned nuclear strategist, uh, but it's still a timely backdrop. And it was also, importantly, uh, one year after Lost ended, so the nation needed more Josh Holloway, so I'm really glad we were able to satisfy that demand. I'm just glad he's working. He's working, yeah. Well, can't be a model every single day. But, Joel, why don't you talk about the movie? What happens in this? So, as the movie starts, we are in the thick of action, as is necessary in a Mission Impossible movie. We have an IMF team that ends up losing nuclear launch codes, and so IMF has to break out the one and only Ethan Hunt, played by Tom Cruise, from a Russian jail cell in order to get those codes back and figure out what's going on and who wants those nuclear codes. Hunt breaks out of the jail cell and finds out that they're tracking down a nuclear extremist named Cobalt. But in order to find out who this guy Cobalt is, they have to break into the Kremlin in order to find because they're Russian mind. Russian launch codes, right? Exactly. I wonder why they call him Cobalt. Um, I know that in Doctor Strange Love, the big Doomsday bomb that's at the end of the movie, they call it a, a Cobalt Thorium G, a super radioactive bomb. So I kind of wonder if that's a little homage to that, or it's just Cobalt is associated sometimes with nuclear issues and weapons and stuff like that. So I don't know. It's very scary sounding, and it sounds pretty cool. So. It makes for a good uh, cocktail for, uh, for a code name. So they race to the Kremlin in order to, to steal the file, but they are a little too late. The file has already been stolen by Cobalt along with a nuclear launch device, they find out. 
But in the ensuing escape, in order to get out of the Kremlin, we find out that Cobalt has actually planted a bomb and incriminated the IMF force and ends up detonating a bomb, blowing up half the Kremlin, and all of a sudden Ethan Hunt and his team are on the run with IMF completely disavowed by the U.S. president. What's going to happen? I don't know. Ethan Hunt, he's in it pretty deep. So, with no backup... Seems, seems impossible to get out of it. seems impossible. I mean, like that fuse, it is impossible. Uh, with no backup, Ethan Hunt and team uh, move on because they realize they can only clear their name if they can actually get to Cobalt and figure out what he's doing with the nuclear launch device and the nuclear code. Yeah, what's it seems like, what do they say he wants to do? Well, this Cobalt guy is an interesting <coughs> character. They're able to identify him eventually. They find that his name is Kurt Hendricks, who is a former Swedish special <laughs> operations guy who then decided to make a career change, went to... Stockholm and became a nuclear physicist. Hmm. It's usually what happens with spec ops guys, I guess. Uh, and then apparently becomes a, an expert in nuclear endgame theory, according oh, to the movie. I think DeVry has one of those programs. Thanks. And then we find out that they fired him from the University of Stockholm because he's, quote, crazy, which I guess would always be a good excuse to... Most of us in this field are pretty fire. crazy. So the IMF that now has no backup tracks down Cobalt to a Dubai office building where, uh, reportedly, Cobalt and his team will be trying to purchase the nuclear launch codes in order to actually launch a nuclear device with that launch vehicle that they purchased. In the ensuing fight, they are able to get close to Cobalt, but they end up losing him. But they are able to track him to a satellite company in India where Cobalt and his team not only commandeer the satellite, but are also able to make contact with a Russian nuclear submarine, launch a nuclear sub, uh, submarine missile, no. and with just a few minutes to spare, even a few seconds to spare, are actually able to abort the detonation of the nuclear missile that's bound for San Francisco, thus saving the day. Whew. That was close. Or Ethan slams his hand on the, the button that just happened to be there, the abort button, and yells, mission accomplished. Pretty good. Pretty good. Pretty good scene. Original. Original. Not as good as uh, the first one, the red light, green light, and he blows up uh, John Renault. John Renault made that movie. So, still pretty good. Uh, so, yeah, so that's an interesting movie. Um, I liked it, but there's some a little bit of nonsense in here. So, I think some of the things I want to talk about uh, that I think would be good topics for us to cover. We talk about the nuclear football. He steals one of these things. Can you actually use it to communicate with a sub commander? Start a war. Uh, we could talk about the rockets that are used here, the missile that gets fired up from the submarine, the warhead that comes down. How is that procedure? Does it look, do they display that correctly? Does it come across as something that if you watch this, you would go, this is how this works and be able to understand that uh, related to that, whether or not you can abort a ballistic missile as it's being fired. Seems like it's an important thing for the movie to be able to have this end goal countdown. You need to stop this thing, a target for the, for Ethan Hunt and his team to work with. But is it actually how this works? Uh, and then finally, we can talk a little bit about the, the nuclear extremist theory about starting a war in a very limited area that may cause people to have peace in the future. Because this is certainly something that, that crazy crackpot scholars have, have put forth. So it would be kind of fun to see where this comes up. Um, but, yeah, so the nuclear football. You've heard of the nuclear football, right, Joel? Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, it's a hallmark of nuclear movies, TV shows. I think most people make – jokes about it on a regular basis as far as, oh, of course, he's got that nuclear football. Have you heard about why it's called the nuclear football? I have not. Why is that? So back in the days when, before we kind of had different code names for things, and everybody loves their code names, the, the PSYOP plan, the, the single integrated operating plan, the set of target lists that we'll be able to do, so it's like a book or, it's, it's in a book, but it's also a, a computer programs and, and ways that they would fire uh, at what countries, what weapons, and in what sequences. They used to call that code name Dropkick. So the people that were handling the nuclear football, which is used to authorize a launch, they thought, what do you dropkick? Dropkick a football. So it all kind of makes sense. And it's, it's just a fun thing to say, pass the football, make sure you hold the football. Um, but so in Russia, they don't call it the nuclear football. They call it the, the, the Cheget, or I don't speak Russian. It's C H E. G-E-T, Chagat. It's a named after a mountain in Russia where a lot of people go skiing. So it's a fun 
imagine every next time you go skiing on a mountain, whether or not that mountain is, is named for the thing that can cause a nuclear war to start. But that's what they call in Russia. It's basically since the, the, the 1980s, they were able to create this uh, particular device. It's mostly used if the president of Russia or in the United States equivalent, the president of the United States, if they're not at the White House or the Kremlin or any place where they can communicate with the infrastructure that actually does the firing of nuclear weapons, it's in case they're, if they're at a school giving a speech to kids, they need to make sure they can communicate with the infrastructure to be able to do this because 30 minutes is how long it takes for a nuclear missile to go from Russia to the United States. They have to be able to quickly respond. So it's like a communication platform. Um, basically what it does in the Russian sense is it links the Russian president to the Russian strategic nuclear forces. They communicate and execute orders to launch nuclear weapons. You may ask, who do you think actually has, like how many of these things basically just watching the movie, Joel, would you think that they exist? Like, does it sound like there's a lot of them? Like, where does he, he goes to the Kremlin and steals one, the cobalt, but what are, how many things do they actually have? I don't know. That's a good question. I mean, I know at least on the American side, whenever you hear about the, the football, it seems like there's only one out there and it's, you know, handcuffed to some guy's arm. And if you don't have that one, then, you know, that's all you can get. But it seemed like in, in the depiction in the movie, there are multiple ones maybe stockpiled in some, you yeah. know, uh, basement uh, closet. The somewhere. basement archives of the Kremlin, yeah. Because it sounds like they wouldn't, they didn't notice that it was missing because the bomb went off and there's – some sort of chaos, and they don't know where it actually is. But we know the Russian president has one because they're the major uh, in person who authorizes an actual attack. But we're pretty sure, based on public information, that the Minister of Defense has one, as well as the chief of the general staff, basically the head of the military, um, the military side of the military, not the civilian side, that they actually have one as well. But the Russian president is the one who actually authorizes a launch, but the other people are needed to be able to to go through that particular process. So tends to what happens is the general staff will get the order to do a launch, and that is done through the nuclear briefcase, which basically confirms that the person giving the launch is the president, the person who's in charge um, to be able to make that decision. The nuclear briefcase was what used to transmit the author uh, authentication, but it actually doesn't launch anything, uh, and it doesn't communicate directly with submarine captains unless the general staff and everywhere else has been taken out, then it can maybe do that. certainly does not have a direct uplink to the missile itself. So unless... So no Wi-Fi. No Wi-Fi. Um, it's connected to like through satellites, and it, sometimes it's hardwired, uh, depending on where they're at. But in particular, unless Cobalt and his team like rewired the system so that it could do this, I don't really know how they would do that. It certainly doesn't communicate directly with the missile or any of those kind of things. Um, but ends up what's happening, the general staff gets the information and it, all, it transmits those codes to submarines, silos, and bombers, um, and then it goes through and, and fires it. Now, if the president is taken out, the next person in line is the prime minister who gets the, the main of these uh, chegettes, the nuclear briefcases, um, and then it goes down the line um, with that because right now the prime minister wouldn't have it. Um, but I think it's kind of an interesting way to, to think about this. Then there is an example in history where a Russian nuclear briefcase went missing. And it was a case in 1991 during uh, a, a attempted coup against uh, Gorbachev. Uh, so what ended up happening was there was an attempted coup when he was on vacation. And the people who tried to do the coup were the other two people who have nuclear briefcases, the um, Minister of Defense and the G Chief of the General Staff thought that Gorbachev was having too many reforms and doing too much things that weren't um, upholding the Russian tradition. So they essentially isolated Gorbachev and they took away his nuclear briefcase. They shut off all communications. They made his nuclear crew, the people who man the, the nuclear su suitcase, they isolated them and, and took it away. So he, for that period of time, those two days when he was under house arrest, had no access to be able to authorize an actual attack. So it's quite fascinating that that in, in individual thing happened. But then, kind of similar to the movie, that once that nuclear briefcase stopped working, um, the people who handled the executing of this process, the general staff that wasn't the head person but the people who actually do the communication as well as the, the Army, the Air Force, and the Navy, once they kind of sensed that a coup was happening, they deactivated the other two nuclear suitcases. So there is precedent for 
these suitcases to be wiped and deactivated if they go missing. And because they are the things, there's three of them, and they're things that are really important to actually launch a nuclear weapon or to authorize the launch of a nuclear weapon, it's really fascinating that in the events of this movie, if one of these go missing, why they wouldn't immediately wipe it um, mm. and start up another one. So it's kind of crazy to think that the p- series of events that happened in, the, in this movie can actually happen now. You can't really steal one of these things and then... You can do it with a smartphone, but you can't do it with the launch codes for well, nuclear weapons. Exactly. Um, yeah, you can re- remote wipe your iPhone, but not this one. But it's just fascinating. Uh, but it's a movie, so it kind of has to have this happen. Uh, it can go through with that. But that's I think it's really interesting how and the nuclear a, suitcase works. it be a military person. I think mo- in most... Uh, you know, American movies, you see like an American military guy. Oh, who handle who yeah, holds it? Or is it civilian? Well, so th- in the United States, um, it's a rotating tour. There's a couple different people that are that have responsibility for it, and then they take turns. Actually, who's on that on deck that day to travel with the president? It, they're always supposed to be wherever the president is. Uh, there's an example of uh, Bill Clinton where he was at a NATO summit uh, near the White House, but accidentally left the person in, from the motorcade that was holding the nuclear suitcase, and that person had to run back to the White House to bring it back um, because the president and the suitcase is not supposed to be separated. Um, And so in the suitcase, at least in the United States, there's a couple different things. There's the communications equipment that can communicate with the the Russian strategic nuclear forces. In the United States, there is a um, list of all the places that the president should go to in the case of a crisis, like the various bunkers and... That process is in there. A physical copy of the what they call O-Plan now, the PSYOP, the list of targets, is there, a classified and unclassified version, so that they can actually flip through the book and say it's like ordering at a, from a menu but where they want to order out for takeout, which countries and areas do they want to blow up and with what particular ingredients do they want to do that, that order from. So that's in there. And a couple other things, so they have a, a copy of the line of succession. So in case the person who's in charge of the nuclear briefcase and the president's dead, they can refer to the book. Okay, now who do I work for? Go to the vice president or go to the speaker of the house. Or they work down the lines about who's then in charge with that particular thing. So that's what the nuclear suitcase is. It's a little misnomer. You see a lot of movies that it seems that it's the thing that fires the weapons. It's not. Uh, it's a thing that communicates to this larger system. But in the movie here, they kind of shortchanged all that. They and consolidated it, a little they bit. They consolidated it. So that may be good for the movie, but it, it's kind of good to get a sense of what that actually is in reality um, this to wor- if you're really worried about this happening. So one other piece that it's kind of odd, uh, some more nuclear nonsense is this, is part of the beginning of this movie is about they stole nuclear launch codes, that the team of Cobalt got these codes from somewhere, and that if you have these launch codes for a couple of days – They'll stay the same, and they can use them in the nuclear launch device to fire off the weapons. Now, launch codes we'll see in a lot of our movies that we watch. It's unclear. They, they don't never specify exactly what they mean. Do they mean the code that authenticates the person who is p- supposed to be holding the nuclear briefcase, whether it be the president of Russia, the minister of defense, or the chief of the general staff? Like You have to be able to authenticate to the person that you're communicating, I'm the person that has the code. Like the president – has in usually in their pocket, they're required to carry around something called the biscuit. The biscuit is a list of um, authentication codes. There's like, say, 10 codes that are on there. You have to break open this plastic box and then look at the code. There's like 10 codes. Only one of them is right. You have to memorize which one is the right one because otherwise someone could steal it and use it. That is the code that you use to authenticate that you're the person that um, you say you are. Is that what they stole? Because then if you have that information, you can authorize a launch and then move to that process. Or are they what they call unblocking codes? There are things that the um, Russian strategic nuclear forces, the actual people that communicate and execute the launch, not the president or the the minister Minister of defense, these are things to basically arm the weapons because the weapons are unarmed. These are things that either unlock permission of action links or they will – um, basically allow the warheads to work. Those are codes, but those aren't necessarily launching codes. Those are codes to unblock the weapon. So it's kind of unclear what they mean. But either way, those codes that the president has um, to be able to au- authenticate themselves and then the codes that launch the weapons or unblock them, those are changed on a very regular basis. So if the codes are missing, 
they can just change them. And everybody gets new codes, and it's a procedure that happens. In the United States, it happens almost on a weekly basis. The NSA will change and, and produces an encrypted code, and then it gets sent out to everybody. So the idea that there's just like these sheets of codes that have been around for quite a while, really interesting. Because in the movie, they, they Cobalt brings a guy with him, or Cobalt's a, a well, Cobalt's assistant brings a Russian nuclear strat or engineer, the guy that redesigned the security system after the end of the Cold War, and the, to be able to look at this sheet of paper and to determine whether or not these are actual codes. But um, I don't know what he would see. The codes change all the time. So he's not looking at a number and saying, oh, these are maybe just to see if they're in the right format, if they have the right font. Font is important. <laughs> Make sure they're in the right font and the right, yeah, the right fi font size and all that kind of stuff. But I don't know. I thought that was really interesting because launch codes are things that change all the time. So yeah, we can talk about a little bit now about like the rocket that gets fired up, the, the ICBM that comes from a, a submarine. I think it's interesting with that because some of that is done quite accurately. Like the idea is really interesting that submarines can fire underwater. Because if they have to surface, then they're vulnerable and can be shot down by someone that's in the area. So they can actually fire the, w the missile vertically, and they fire it up with air pressure. Um, they get shot up out of the water, and then once it's up out of the water and it's cleared it, then the primary gets launched off, and that shoots it into the direction that we see. So actually, you can see videos on YouTube of the U.S. Trident missiles um, being launched out of some submarines, or at least during some tests. It's pretty awesome. See a giant rocket fly up out of the water, nothing, just hangs in the air for a second, and then shoots off in the direction that it needs to go. So they did that pretty well. Um, but then from there, the movie kind of goes a little nutty. Uh, in the movie, you could only see some quick shots of the missile, but you see the missile um, burn up in to get into space. And then you keep seeing like basically like the same rocket flying in space with propulsion. And then you see that same rocket enter the atmosphere again, what they call the terminal phase, from when it comes from space and then lands at the target that it wants to. That still has a rocket that gets fired. That's a little naughty. That's probably just a visual for the audience to be able to look at. Yeah. Well, and also, I mean, it seemed like it was almost flying across the city as opposed yeah. to coming straight down. It's coming down, straight down. So that's, so that's interesting because most of these missiles, they follow ballistic paths. They're essentially like if you've lobbed something. Um, once you lob it, it doesn't really maneuver anymore. There's some – they were some designing some things. Do, do everyone's heard of MIRVs, those m multiple independently targeted reentry vehicles? They had something called MARVs, uh, so MIRVs and MARVs. MARVs are maneuverable reentry vehicles. So these are things that where the warhead itself could, like, jump up um, a couple hundred – miles and then jump back down a couple hundred miles. But this is while it's in space to maneuver around missile defense systems. But it doesn't have like another rocket pack attached to it to fly around. That would make the missile itself too heavy and makes it harder for you to actually launch something very far because the more things you put into a warhead, heavier it is, the harder it is to get it over long distances. So it tends to be what you would actually see is you would see that same rocket go up and then once it's in space it separates the warhead which looks like an ice cream cone about the size of a like a desk or a, 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 a water heater a water heater uh, machine snow cone maker but it separates from the bus if it's a merv it separates from the bus because there's a couple different wa warheads that are on there and it follows that path and that's what actually enters the atmosphere um, it's very aerodynamic and it flies down and it looks like that but it would look probably funny on a screen to see a an ice cream cone flying towards San Francisco and to have that shut off. So did they get the dimensions right? I mean, it seemed like... Uh, I, it's much smaller than they do within the movie. Yeah, because it seemed pretty big. Like, it was... They are trying to make it look more like a full-on, like, missile that most people expect to see in a movie. Now, they're cruise missiles, so it kind of almost operates like a cruise missile. Those are things that are like Tomahawk missiles that, that can be launched from submarines, but they don't go into space. They, they f fly from the submarine in a direct path, usually pretty low to the ground, and... Those can maneuver a little bit around targets that it knows that are there. but th So those are separate things. I, they don't launch a cruise missile in this. They launch an, an ICBM um, that flies into space from wherever they happen to be when they fire it. So I thought that was really interesting, what the, some of the choices they make. But that's probably just cinematic choices to be able to visualize it. Because once Ethan hits the abort button, um, it shuts off the rocket. 
I guess, or shuts off something that, that couldn't really hard to tell. It shuts it off, and then you see the rocket kind of just fall into the ocean after it hits a building, and then every, every, everyone's fine, and everything's good. So I imagine once it's launched, probably the United States government, not just the four-person IMF team, would likely know that something's in the air and heading toward the United States. They don't talk about that, but I would definitely think that they would know that. And so, I mean, at that point, what are the, the countermeasures that, you know— See if you can swat it down before it lands. Well, we have a, we have uh, supposedly a, a national missile defense in some form that with some number of, of interceptors that that are working. But it sounds like is it more than four people? It's more than four. It's it's unclear about what actually they do because if there is an incoming missile and it does get pretty close, I mean, to actually exploding over San Francisco. And this is another thing that I uh, that I like to nitpick is it looks like it's about a thousand feet above the ground which is exactly where these type of warheads detonate. If they were trying to destroy a city, it wouldn't – I don't know how much further this rocket was supposed to go before it exploded the warhead, but 1,000 feet is exactly where it needs to be to blow up the city because any further out, it looked like it was going to hit like over the ocean as opposed to hitting to the center of the city. I don't know because they talk about – you know whatever the operation was that Cobalt said, Operation Iron Fist or something. So, t- so Tim, why is Should have been a, just like a city-destroying thing. So, But why would it detonate 1,000 feet above? I mean, I think most people think of traditional, like, bombs. Mm-hmm. They hit the ground or they hit their target, and then they blow up. So you wouldn't want the nuclear, you know, weapon, whatever it may be, to to hit the building or hit a, a particular place on the ground? So you would think about if you're, what your mission is. If you want to blow up a city, you want to blow up a wide area to be able to hit. And most like buildings are less hardened against what they call pressure, the blast wave. Most of the destruction of a nuclear bomb comes from the blast. The shock wave creates pressure, overpressure, and it pushes over things. A house has lower overpressure limits than a skyscraper or a, um, a tank or a hardened missile silo. So you have to say if a building needs X amount of overpressure for to knock it down, or skyscraper needs X amount to knock it down, you want to take – and you want to blow up as large of an area as you can. Imagine a, a bomb going off just in the air. What it would produce is a shock wave that goes out from that in like a sphere, so like a circle. Now you take that circle and you put it directly – the start of that circle directly onto the ground. You get the overpressure that goes up out of that, but in terms of what's on the ground itself, you then create a crater – that's underneath that particular area. So, so much of the shockwave is, 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 yeah, it's not efficient if you want to destroy a wide area. Those are what you do if you want to hit a bunker or you want to hit um, something that's buried underground. That's the kind of thing. Or if you want to hit something that you know is hardened or is a you know, military installation that has concrete infrastructure, you want to be able to hit that. That's what you do. For a city-destroying thing, you put it up at a certain height, usually about 1,000 feet, so that the maximum amount of shockwave hits the maximum amount of things. So it's to be the way they do it efficiently. Now, I, they don't ever say what he's, he's supposed to do with Cobalt's mission and, and what the target is, but it sounds like it's to destroy San Francisco. So w- it's weird that it didn't blow up, but, you know, it's like a, it was like two seconds away from exploding, so it sounds like they were just in the nick of time um, for when they wanted to actually fire that thing. And the other thing that's interesting, too, is he only fired one rocket with one warhead, it sounds like, but most submarines and submarine-launched intercontinental ballistic missiles have multiple warheads on them. So we should have seen that same missile go up in the air into space, separate into like 10 warheads, and each of those warheads then go on to hit their independent targets. Um, Most of those tend to be MIRVs uh, that are on submarines, at least in the U.S. fleet. So, But again, movie magic. A little consolidation. Yeah, a little little super critical about it. Um, But the big thing that this movie relies on is the idea that you can abort a missile as it's coming down to blow up a city. That doesn't happen. You wouldn't want your your warheads to be able to be aborted because if you can cancel the the warhead as it's coming down, it leaves it vulnerable to the enemy to be able to do the same thing, to shut it off as it's coming down and to basically make it into a dud. So those things, once – an ICBM is launched, that's it. There's no more communication with it. It doesn't doesn't maneuver around. It launches up in a, in a ballistic path, and once it's on that path, it's it. 
there's no recall ability. The things that you can recall are bombers. So that's why bombers are considered to be an important part of our our nuclear triad, which is the submarines, the land-based missiles, and then the bombers, is because until a certain point when bombers go quiet and they don't have any more radio transmission and they want to go stealth, you can recall a bomber. You can send a bomber out, say, look, other guy that we're about to bomb, we're very serious about this situation, back down. And then once they back down, you can recall the bombers. You don't want to overcomplicate this process because that's one more thing that can go wrong right. and you don't want that to happen. So you can't shut off a missile once it's in space. You can a, a blow up and, uh, and terminate a missile like during a test. They have those set up. Like if they test a missile that has a, you know, a dud warhead on there, they have those for safety purposes in case something goes wrong with the test. But once these things are deployed, you can't that, – it's the whole point of this process is not to do that. So it's very fascinating that there's a button – on this particular well, launching to mention, device to on shut it the off. Launch. I mean, I, that's what I thought was interesting. That I guess it, it becomes, it seems natural in like kind of movie magic to, you know, because it makes it easier from a plot perspective to have both the the entity that's launching the the weapon, which is the bad guy, to also mm-hmm. have the capability to stop it. So you find the bad guy when he launches it, and also stop the guy, and you can do it. Yeah, but why? But why would actually you'd probably have some other station, or if you, even if you had an abort function or self destruct, mm-hmm. it would probably be some other place where you'd have to go. But again, exactly, that'd well, be harder to do for ma- movie, movie purposes. Movie magic. But why would why would the bad guy who wants to fire the missile have anything like if they reconfigured the launching device to be able to have an abort button? What conceivable situation? Like all of a sudden he finds out, oh my god. My favorite band is playing right now in San Francisco. Never mind, abort, abort, abort. Like, why would he not want to follow through with his plan? I don't know. That all didn't that didn't really make any sense to me. But the last piece of this, which is really fun, is the nuclear extremist plan, which we talked a little bit about. It's to have a controlled nuclear explosion in one city, and then from the ashes of that city, people will be peaceful, and they won't want to do nuclear war anymore, or they won't want to continue along the path of destruction. He talks about the world in that, in that very evil speech that he gives. Um, looks like it's almost at the UN when he was younger, Cobalt. He said that civilization and the Earth every couple of millennia basically resets, and it's time to reset. Stan, what do you think about that? Uh, well, it's interesting. I mean, they, they branded it nuclear endgame theory, which I don't know if that is – is that a formal title for a, a theory out there? Sure. Too? <laughs> sure. Okay. Um, I mean, from as a movie goer, I thought it was interesting because it was a little bit different spin than you usually hear. I mean, usually when you see an action movie and you've got your Arnold Schwarzenegger and, and whoever, it's you know either some uh, country that wants to do something or – uh, maybe it's a, a terrorist group that wants to blow up bec- uh, a country or, or, or someone because of some mm-hmm. particular issue. This was the first instance that I think I've seen where the you know the the person wanting to blow up a nuclear device is doing it in order to bring peace to the to the world. So I thought it was a little bit interesting because you know it it, it does throw you for a loop for okay. So what would you do to actually stop that person who's intent on detonating a bomb to stop? additional bombs in the mm-hmm. future from, from being detonated. Well, the Cobalt mentions that from the ashes of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, now these are thriving civilizations, which is – it's kind of interesting. I mean I'm sure a lot of the cities that were in Japan in world, after World War II that were firebombed and have since recovered better than they were, um, not necessarily because of the atomic bomb that was dropped there. It seems like that has more to do with the fact that Japan is modernized and – it is not the same way that they were in World War II. Um, but it's certainly true that those those cities and the mayors of those cities are one of the major international figures in the global disarmament, nuclear disarmament movement. So, I mean, that's certainly true. Once you're affected by something, you tend to be understanding that position. You want to advocate for it. But it's interesting. Do they imply then that it's like a regional thing, like like San Francisco, the ashes of San Francisco – would now be a U.S. equivalent of that, or are they, or is he trying to say like to start a global yeah, well, nuclear no, it, war? It, it was like more it was the latter because uh, I mean that was the role of the Kremlin explosion, so that was the provocation, and then the the first nuclear uh, so blast would be perceived by the United States mm. as retaliation for 
you know, quote unquote, you know, U.S. aggression attack to keep it Kremlin. going. And so by doing that, you then kickstart a chain of events that the guy thinks will start global thermonuclear war, which we know from the movie War Games, <laughs> the only winning move is not to play. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's fascinating. Because he says, you know, it, it has to be shared or felt equally mm -hmm. by everyone. And so I think the idea is that you get a global nuclear war, and then the 5% of the world that actually survives it realizes that maybe we shouldn't have done nuclear war. I mean, that's why they described him as crazy, as to think about what, kind of what, would, be, what would be left to kind of make that next civilization. This is why it's kind of crazy. But, you know, I did high school and college policy debate, which sometimes is very good about being able to communicate and debate very important issues like the economy or politics or war and peace. But sometimes you can also get kind of weird. So one argument that people used to have was what was called spark. And it was if you were losing an argument that said if you do X, Y, and Z, it'll cause a war and it'll escalate and it'll get nuclear, you can say, well, that's actually a good thing because – people, if there was a limited nuclear war, then people would say, oh my gosh, look how this affects us. We should disarm all of our weapons. So if you can keep it a limited nuclear war, everybody either in that country or around the world can see, gosh, we've done such a terrible thing. Look how horrible this is. Let's all disarm. Or another side of this silly argument is that people in the United States or somewhere else in the world are going to create weapons like dark matter weapons or weapons that will destroy not only all of the the world, but the universe itself. Therefore, destroy kicking it up a notch. Kicking it up a notch. It's going to escalate pretty quickly. If you were to then wipe out humanity, then you'd be able to save the universe. So it's kind of that weird utilitarian calculation of morality. How many people are you willing to kill to save a larger number? Is it simply about saving the largest number of people then maybe if you believe honestly that a small nuclear war would – or a limited use would then not kill everybody, but all the people that would be left and all the people after that that would be born, they would be people that would benefit from that. So then you weigh numbers, and that's that kind of craziness that uh, I guess our friend Hendricks calculated um, after he was done with, yeah. with his, his Swiss degree – career change. So yeah, that spark argument's kind of nonsense, but it's something that I was very surprised to see in a Mission Impossible movie, something that I had not thought about for quite a while since my silly days in, in policy debate. It's something that people would watch in, when they watch a Mission Impossible movie and probably don't remember that part of it. What they'll remember is Tom Cruise on the outside of that gigantically tall building, and those are coming some of the scenes that, that they remember, not the the nuclear extremists and their theories. Okay, so let's talk about final judgments in this, Joel. You like this movie? I did. I thought uh, it probably wasn't one of the the best one. I mean, I think still the, the, the best one of the franchise, at least, was number one. I, I did like how it kind of turned the, oh, run after the guy who has nuclear launch codes and wants to blow a city up. Not on its head, but kind of gave it a fresh reboot uh, in order to, give a different spin on, on nuclear issues and, and how you stop someone who's, who's trying to do that. So uh, definitely a, a new direction and good one to keep the franchise fresh and, and kind of present a similar action plot in a different way. Yeah, the action in this movie was definitely pretty good. Um, and I think even though the pushing the, the abort button is kind of silly given what, what people might know about uh, nuclear weapons and things that I've studied and – that certainly took me out of the moment, but I'm, I understand that I'm in the minority here. I still enjoy the movie uh, quite a bit, so I, I'm happy that it. Uh, I'm happy that it exists, even though it is miseducating everybody about nuclear issues. But it is kind of scary because y people might think that there's a lot of checks to actually using a nuclear weapon. That if we were to fire an, a nuclear-tipped missile, that we could have a chance to say, "Oh shoot! Turns out this was an accident." This was a mistake. Whoops. Whoops. And, oh, we just pushed this button to detonate it. Well, there isn't that chance. Okay, so after we're done with that movie, um, what else can we recommend? Bruce Blair, who is an expert in the, the Russian um, command and control and the United States command and control systems, wrote a book called The Logic of Accidental Nuclear War. And he's a big advocate for what we call de-alerting 
our nuclear forces, basically taking them off of hair trigger alert, putting taking the warheads off the missiles so that it takes more time to be able to actually launch them and to make that decision, as well as a book from the Russian side uh, by Alexei Armitov um, from 2000. He works at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace called The Equation of Security, where he goes through the, the Russian side of that um, particular piece. <laughs> Well, thanks for listening. Uh, we are working to make each episode of this podcast better. We hope you enjoyed this one. But to make the next one even better, uh, we're going to rely on you. Do you have any ideas for future episodes or guests or topics to be able to cover? Uh, please reach us on Facebook at uh, facebook.com slash supercriticalpodcast. You can also reach us on Twitter at Nuclear Podcast. And we're checking email too, supercriticalpodcast at gmail.com. Send us your ideas, and we would love to be able to, to hear from you. We'll try to announce the, our next movie ahead of time on Facebook and Twitter. So you can submit some questions and let us know what you want to cover, um, what are the kind of things you would like us to ramble on, and all that. See you next time. And remember, if it's pop culture and radioactive, we're bound to get supercritical about it. Supercritical.